Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we take up important news articles from the Hindu. These news articles are important from the UPSC examination perspective and other competitive examination. The topics for today's discussion are displayed on your screen. Now let's begin the discussion. The first topic we are going to discuss is based on the news article which appeared in the Hindu. The article basically talks about 17th century personality Allah Baksh and his paintings were inspired from Mewari miniature paintings. Above the article there is mention of Vyankulit which is a traditional form of shadow puppet play originally found in cultures of Java and Bali in Indonesia. The narratives of Vyankulit is based on the major theme of good versus evil taking inspiration from Ramayana and Mahabharata. And in 2003, UNESCO designated Vayam Kulit as a masterpiece of oral and intangible heritage of humanity. Taking cue from this article, we will be discussing about miniature paintings in India and some of the basics related to puppetry in India. The topic is important from prelims perspective as it forms part of General Studies Paper 1, Indian Heritage and Culture. In 2015, question appeared on Kalari Payet 2 and from the statements given below, you have to choose the correct one which relates to Kalari Payet 2. Firstly, let us discuss some of the basics related to miniature paintings in India. Miniature paintings are bright, individually created, small works of art. The colors utilized in the paintings come from a variety of organic materials including fruits, indigo, precious stones, gold and silver. The Palas of Bengal are considered as the forerunners of miniature paintings in India. But it was under the Mughals that the miniature paintings attained its zenith. When the Palas ruled over India's eastern region around 750 AD, the miniature paintings first appeared there. The religious teachings of Buddha, which included his images, were inscribed on palm leaves, which is how these paintings came to be well known. The similar type of paintings were imported to Western India by the Chalukyan dynasty around 960 AD and the popularity of miniature paintings began to expand with the expansion of Mughal Empire and the Indian miniature paintings merged elements of Persian style of painting during Akbar's reign. These paintings during the Mughal times also showed influence from the European paintings during the time of Shah Jahan. Further, the Rajput kings of Rajasthan continued to support these miniature paintings and the artist even after the Mughal Empire had collapsed. And the miniature paintings from Rajasthan had unique characteristics and frequently portrayed the royal lifestyle and the tales of Krishna and Radha, despite being influenced by the Mughal style of painting. Moving on, let us discuss some of the features related to puppetry in India. Puppetry has held a deep fascination in India for a considerable duration and serving both as a source of entertainment and a tool for education. The archaeological findings at the Harappan and Mohenjo-daro has unveiled puppets featuring attached sockets indicative of existence of puppetry as an artistic expression. Also, references to marionette theatre have also been unearthed dating back to around 500 BC. However, the earliest documented reference to puppetry can be traced to Tamil classic Silapadikaram, composed during 1st and 2nd centuries BC. Beyond its role as an art form, puppetry has carried significant philosophical importance within Indian culture. And within theatre, the storyteller was known as Sutradhar or the holder of strings. Puppetry in India can be broadly classified into four categories. The first one is glove puppets. The three important examples of glove puppets are Pavakotu from Kerala, Sakhi Kundei Nata from Orissa, and Beni Putul, a tradition in Bengal. The second type is rod puppets. Examples are Putul Naj, prominent in West Bengal, Kathi Kandehi, commonly used in Orissa, Yampuri, a traditional form in Bihar. The third type is shadow puppets, and the examples are Tholu Bomalatta from Andhra Pradesh. Togalu Gomayatta from Karnataka, Tol Pawa Kothu from Kerala, Chamadi Ache Bahulya from Maharashtra, Ravan Chaya from Orissa, and Tol Bomalattam from Tamil Nadu. The last type is of string puppets. The important examples are Putul Naj from Assam, Gomayatta from Karnataka, Kalsutri Bahulya from Maharashtra, Gopalila Kundehi from Orissa, 
Katputli from Rajasthan and Bomalattam from Tamil Nadu. You can take screenshot of this slide. The answer for this previous year question is option D. That is Kalari Payattu is an ancient martial art and a living tradition in some parts of South India. With this, we will be ending discussion on this topic. The second topic of today's session is based on the news article which appeared on editorial page of the Hindu. The article relates to importance of population in the aspect of governance. It impacts representation, resource allocation, economic development, social services, infrastructure and political influence. And if we look at the Indian political system and federation, population has been the key determinant of state policy in terms of political representation in Lok Sabha and distribution of resources among the states. And as the population evolves, these dimensions change as well. And that is where the conflict arises because the change is reflected in change in number of seats and the finances allocated to the states. Here in this article, we are going to understand population in political representation and role of population in fiscal transfers. The topic is important from UPSC perspective as it becomes part of general studies paper 2 syllabus. Indian constitution features significant provisions, development and management of social sector services relating to health, education, human resources. Firstly, we will be looking at population in political representation. Article 81 of the Indian Constitution stipulates that Lok Sabha constituencies in the country should be equal by size of population and for the purpose of holding direct elections to the Lok Sabha, each state is divided into territorial constituencies and in this respect, the constitution makes the following two provisions. Each state is allotted a number of seats in Lok Sabha in such a manner that the ratio between that number and its population is same for all the states. However, this provision does not apply to a state having a population of less than 6 million. The second provision is each state is divided into territorial constituencies in such a manner that the ratio between the population of each constituency and number of seats allotted to it is the same throughout the state. So in brief, we can understand that the constitution ensures that there is uniformity of representation in two respects. These are between different states and between different constituencies in the same state. So where does the problem arises? The problem is that the population growth rates differ between non-Hindi speaking southern states and the Hindi speaking northern states. As we can see, in between 1971 and 2011, the proportion of population of Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh increased from 44% to 48.2% whereas the proportion of population of five southern states, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Telangana declined from 24.9% to 21.1%. And if equal size of Lok Sabha constituencies by population is enforced today, as in the population projections of 2023, then five southern states will lose 23 seats while the northern states will gain 37 seats. And this can be understood with an example. The attempt to equalize the size of constituencies by population is based on principle of one person, one vote and one value. And to give a perspective from 2019 elections, a member of parliament from northern states of Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh represented around 18 lakh registered electors while the five southern state member of parliament represented around 16 lakh registered electors which means the real meaning of one person one vote and one value is lost in this system so what is required in india's political system when india's government aim to control the population through family planning states that have successfully reduced their population should not face reduced political representation in the future as population control isn't just about family planning programs it is also driven by societal changes promoted by the leaders of southern states. 
So, decreasing the political representation of these states in the national parliament isn't fair. It might even discourage other states from taking population control and societal change seriously. And therefore, to solve this, we should keep the distribution of seats among states frozen as it was in 1971 until all states stabilize their populations. The 42nd Amendment Act of 1976 froze the allocation of seats in Lok Sabha to the states and division of each state into territorial constituencies till the year 2000 at 1971 level. And the 87th Amendment Act of 2003 provided for delimitation of constituencies on the basis of 2001 census. Moving on, let us discuss the role of population in fiscal transfers. Once in five years, the union government constitutes a finance commission to recommend, among other things, the share of each state in the assigned tax revenue of the union. And every finance commission recommends a formula for horizontal distribution of union government's tax revenue among the states. Let us look at the criterion to determine the distribution. Here in the table, you can see the criterion to determine the distribution. And from the table above, we can see that under 15th Finance Commission report, population appears at three places. That is, population from 2011 census, income distance and demographic performance, as population of a state is a measure of demand for public expenditure. Therefore, it is an important variable in the distribution formula. Now, the per capita income of a state is considered as a proxy for its ability to raise its own revenue. And the higher the per capita income of a state, the lower is its share in the union tax revenue. The lower per capita income of a state may be due to higher population for a given gross domestic product. Therefore, the higher the current population of a state, the higher is its share in the union tax revenue. And it is also important to note here that usually the per capita income is assigned larger weight in distribution formula favoring the northern states. The terms of reference of 15th Finance Commission openly declared taking 2011 population as the distribution formula. And with this, the southern states lost the advantage of getting some financial rewards for population control. Therefore, the southern states have already started facing reduced financial transfers from the union government as a reward for controlling population growth. So from this discussion, we can understand that in this complex landscape, the challenge lies in striking a balance between representation and demographic realities and financial equity, ensuring fairness in political representation, resource allocation, while acknowledging that diverse population dynamics across states is crucial for effective governance and well-being of the citizens. And with this, we will be ending the discussion on this topic. The third topic of today's session is based on the news article which appeared on page number one of the Hindu. Glacier Lake burst in Sikkim have led to the death of seven people. The South Lonak Lake has suddenly overflowed into Tista River, creating flash floods that destroyed the Chungtang Dam. The topic is important from General Studies Paper 1 perspective, forming part of Geography and General Studies Paper 3 Disaster Management. Also, on similar lines, question appeared in 2022, which stated, explain the causes and effects of coastal erosion in India. What are the available coastal management techniques for combating hazard? In 2017, the question was relating to climate change and its impact on Himalayan and coastal states of India. First, let us look at the location of the disaster. The South Lonak Lake is a glacial moraine dammed lake located in Sikkim's far northwestern region. It is one of the fastest expanding lakes in the Sikkim Himalayan region. ISRO has released pre and post scenario of the disaster. Before understanding the term glacial lake outburst, first let us understand what are glacial lakes. It is a body of water that originates from a glacier and it typically forms at the foot of a glacier but may form on, in or under it. Lakes form when meltwater ponds and this can happen on the ice surface that is supraglacial lakes, in front of the ice that is proglacial lakes or even underneath the ice that is subglacial lakes. 
Now let us see what are glacial lake outburst flood. It is the term used to describe the incident when water levels of glacial lakes breach their boundaries causing large amounts of water to flow into nearby streams and rivers. This also creates situations of flash floods. The glacial lake outburst flood are often attributed to climate change and increase of anthropogenic footprints on glaciers and the possible reasons can be any geophysical phenomenon that destabilizes the water level in glacial lake which subsequently results in breach of the water boundaries. The figure here shows various reasons for the glacial lake outburst. These can be due to cloud burst, snow avalanches, landslides, melting of the ice in moraines, earthquake and overflow. And when the glacial lake burst, the water flows into downstream areas at extreme speed and this causes massive damage to the infrastructure and therefore the glacial lake outburst remain a persistent threat to the downstream communities and infrastructure besides flora and fauna. As we have seen in June 2013, Uttarakhand had received an unusual amount of rainfall leading to the melting of Chorabari glacier and eruption of the Mandakini river. The floods affected large parts of Uttarakhand and reportedly the worst hit was the Kedarnath Valley in Uttarakhand as the flood left behind a death toll of more than 5000. Moving on, let us see some of the guidelines on risk reduction due to the glacial lake outburst. The first one is to identify the potential dangerous lakes. To identify the potentially dangerous lakes based on field observation, records of the past events, geomorphologic and geotechnical characteristics of the lake and surroundings and other physical conditions. The second one can be use of the technology such as promoting use of synthetic aperture radar imagery, a form of radar that is used to create two dimensional images to automatically detect changes in water bodies including new lake formations during the monsoon months. The third one is channeling of potential floods. The National Disaster Management Authority has recommended reducing the volume of water with methods such as controlled breaching, pumping or siphoning of water and making a tunnel through the moraine barrier or under an ice dam. There is also need to develop a broad framework for infrastructure development, construction and excavation in vulnerable zones and promote uniform codes for construction activity. One important challenge is the number of implemented and operational glacial lake outburst early warning system is very small even at the global scale. The need is to enhance the early warning systems. The National Disaster Management Authority has also emphasized the need for training the local manpower. It has been observed that 80% of search and rescue is carried out by the local community before the intervention of the state machinery and specialized search and rescue teams. The local teams could also assist in planning and setting up emergen emergency shelters, distributing relief packages, identifying missing people, addressing the needs of food, healthcare and water supply. And besides classical alarming infrastructure consisting of acoustic alarms by sirens, the modern communication technology using cell and smartphones can complement or even replace traditional alarming infrastructure. In the year 2020, National Disaster Management Authority had issued detailed guidelines on how to reduce and deal with disasters caused by glacial burst. And to reduce the risk due to the glacial lake outburst, the need is to implement the measures suggested by NDMA in letter and spirit. And with this, we will be concluding the discussion on third topic. The fourth topic of today's session is important from General Studies Paper 3 perspective, science and technology, scientific developments and their applications. The 2023 Nobel Prize for Chemistry has been awarded to Alexei Ekimov, Louis Bruss, Mongi Bowendi for their work on quantum dots. The topic is important as in 2022, question appeared on similar lines on nanoparticles. 
uh, here you have to identify the correct statements from the options given below before proceeding on discussing the article let us first see some of the fundamental facts of chemistry as we know every element exhibits specific properties determined by the number of electrons in its atoms and the distribution of this electron around its nucleus so every piece of a pure element exhibits the same properties regardless of its size for example pure gold has properties different from silver or any other element also a large 100 gram piece of gold will have exact properties like a small 100 mg piece however the particles at nanoscale level display peculiar behavior very small particles in the nanoscale range behave slightly different from the larger particles of the same element example a nanoparticle of gold displays properties different in some respects from the larger particles of gold and the reasons for this deviation is when the size of particles is reduced to the nanoscale level electrons in the atoms find themselves constrained in a small space giving rise to quantum effects now let us look at the nobel meaning research the scientists were successful in developing efficient methods to produce nano sized particles that behaved slightly different from the larger particles of the same element and these nano particles with special properties are called quantum dots now let us briefly look at the features of quantum dots quantum dots are tiny particles on nano crystals of semiconducting material with a diameter in the range of 2 to 10 nanometers quantum dots are nano sized in all three dimensions and are made from a semiconductor such as silicon they behave like artificial atoms as they can have a fixed number of electrons in a confined space leading to unique properties that are size dependent quantum dots exhibit special properties when they interact with light in general the color of any material depends on the wavelengths of light spectrum absorbed or reflected by the material however quantum dots made from the same material will re-emit different colors of light depending on their size the biggest quantum dots produce the longest wavelengths while the smallest dots make shorter wavelengths and the higher frequencies lastly let us look at the applications of quantum effects the first one is bioimaging quantum dots are considered to be superior to traditional organic dyes and can be used in bioimaging as qds are 20 times brighter and 100 times more stable than the traditional fluorescent dyes and quantum dyes are very bright and can be made to produce any color of visible light and theoretically last indefinitely as they are photostable the second application can be seen in biosensors quantum dot sensors can detect the presence of pathogens in food and water or monitor the levels of pollutants in the environment the application can also be seen in targeted cancer treatment as quantum dots exhibit specific optoelectronic properties and they can be used for fluorescence imaging where quantum dots are injected into the body which when encounters a cancer cell attaches to it and when a light of a certain frequency is shined it lights up and doctors can exactly target these cells quantum dots can be targeted as single organs much more precisely than the conventional drugs thus reducing the unpleasant side effects that are characteristic of untargeted traditional chemotherapy the application of quantum dots can also be seen in optical applications quantum dots could be used to make smaller and more efficient image sensors like cmos sensors the quantum leds are capable of emitting all colors depending on their size and they are brighter than the organic leds they can produce light dense cells and need no backlight making them much more energy efficient the quantum dots have the potential to boost efficiency of silicon photovoltaic cells also the quantum dots are best suited for photonic based computing capable of achieving high speeds lastly the answer for this previous question is option d as statement 1 is incorrect 
and with this we will be concluding the discussion of fourth topic the next topic relates to national investment and infrastructure fund recently india's national investment and infrastructure fund and japan bank for international cooperation jointly launched a dollar 600 million fund for climate and environmental projects the topic is important from general studies paper 3 perspective economy also in 2017 question directly appeared on the national investment and infrastructure fund the first statement says it is an organ of niti ayog and the second statement says it has a corpus of rupees 4 lakh crores at present the answer for this previous year question will be given at the end of the discussion first let us look at the need of national investment and infrastructure fund infrastructure projects frequently exhibit long gestation periods creating challenge for financial institutions to manage their short term liabilities with these long term cash flow profiles and to avoid asset liabilities mismatch faced by banks in funding infrastructure projects government has constituted national investment and infrastructure fund with an authorized capital of 20000 crores to provide long term institutional investment support to infrastructure projects in india the national investment and infrastructure fund is a state owned fund created by the government of india in the year 2015 and it functions under department of economic affairs ministry of finance the objective of the fund is to support infrastructure development in india and it caters to greenfield projects and brownfield projects the fund gathers capital from both domestic and international investors and it has three important components under it these are master fund master fund primarily invest in infrastructure related projects such as roads ports airports and power it invest in both greenfield and brownfield projects greenfield projects are the new projects and brownfield projects are already operating projects the next component is fund of funds the fund of fund invest in other funds managed by the renowned fund managers having a good track record in funding successful infrastructure projects which means this fund acts as an anchor investor to other private funds the third component is strategic opportunities fund and the strategic opportunities fund targets to invest in companies belonging to sectors that have good growth potential and from the above discussion it becomes clear option d is the correct answer the last topic of today's session is important from general studies paper 3 perspective science and technology internet and communication technology from prelims perspective it is important to have knowledge about recent satellite systems or developments in science and technology for example in 2022 question appeared on fractional orbital bombardment system so the news article says an international team of scientists have published a paper that outlines the impact of prototype blue bocker tree satellite on astronomy so let us see some of the facts related to blue bocker tree satellite it is a prototype satellite part of a satellite constellation planned to deliver mobile or broadband services anywhere in the world and it is considered the largest commercial antenna system ever deployed in low earth orbit so what is low earth orbit low earth orbit is relatively closer to earth surface and the altitude could be around 160 km to 1000 km and satellites placed in low earth orbit can have tilted plane blue orbit satellite was launched in the year 2022 by ast space mobile a us based company and the satellite deploys a 10 meter diameter faced array antenna comprising numerous identical sub antenna modules with a total area of 64 square meters and these modules will connect directly to standard mobile phones however the apparent brightness of this satellite is variable reaching a peak comparable to that of procyon and archener two of the brightest stars in the night sky and this remarkable brightness 
results from a massive faced array antenna making it appear like a giant mirror reflecting sunlight from earth's perspective the blue hopper satellite transmits at radio frequencies that are close to bands reserved for radio astronomy which could cause interference in the study of the universe which is a matter of concern lastly the answer for this previous year question is option c that is fractional orbital bombardment system is a missile that is put into a stable orbit around the earth and deorbits over a target on the earth and with this we will be ending today's session